Okay, hello Scott. This is probably a video that is going to be specific to you and hopefully at a later date I will go ahead and actually make a more generic video of how to digitize using Global Mapper. I'm actually starting to think that I may do a video series on how to digitize in uh, ArcGIS as well. Um, but this one's going to be specific to you. I just want to go over some of the details. And again, I'm terribly sorry for the delay in this. Um, but hopefully this will provide a good resource for you to at least begin digitizing. Um, probably raise some questions that we can then address. And because this is kind of my first dry run with this process, um, I've tested a couple times, but um, going through the process a little bit, uh, I'm sure there's going to be things that I don't answer, and there's probably going to be questions that are raised by you, which will likely mean that we'll need to talk uh, some more in detail, and maybe I'll create another video. Um, it'll probably require some research on my part to figure out what we're doing. Um, so forgive me if this is a little kludgy, because it kind of is. Um, I've played around with this a little bit, not extensively but enough to where I feel comfortable that I can go ahead and at least get you started. And then as you have questions, as I have more um, adaptations or things we can do, uh, we'll add those in and maybe make more comments. But like I said, I sort of hope to make a generic video in the future, whereas this is going to be a specific video to you. Um, what you're likely going to get is a packet of information from me that I will post to uh, Google Drive and then you'll be able to download it. I'll probably save it as a zip file and it'll have uh, this global mapper package in it as well as most of the shape files that you're seeing in here denoted by the dot SHP here down at the end of the, the, the um, I'm drawing a blank on what that's called, the file extension. Um, there are some here that is a user-created feature that will likely, I'm a, I can go ahead and close this overlay right now, and it'll disappear. At some point, we need to be careful. If we accidentally save a file to the wrong location, that's where it'll be. But so long as you provide me with all of those files back again, that that package, basically, um, everything should work out just fine. Um so don't worry too much about it. I've got things turned off currently that probably we won't be able to use. If you're wanting to use stations, because you've got samples, there's generic samples. If you've got age date, there's some geochron points. Uh, there's some generic points that we can put in there. Things like that. Uh, I've got a lot of those turned off currently to start. Well, well, let me do that there. I've got a lot of these turned off currently to start. Because mostly... Um, at least now, uh, it'd probably be easier to go ahead and digitize your lines and your orientation points and folds and stuff like that. But if you do have um, sample locations that you want to get down because you're going to age date those or something like that, we should go ahead and get those in. Um, let me know and I can get that information to you. Um, the other thing I will make a statement on is most of this is coded for symbology by the FGDC codebook. I think we've talked about this before. Um, that's available online. I currently don't have any more paper copies, otherwise I would be sending one up to you. I'm gonna try and get in contact with Dave Soller again and see if he can send me some more of those. Um, but that will be the basic for basis for where we're getting all this information from. Also online will be the uh, NCGMP09 data model. And that'll basically tell you where all of the different features go. Uh, I'll run through this fairly quickly um, so that maybe I can give you a generic overview that you can refer back to in this video so we know where things uh, go. Cartographic lines. That will be the features that are your cartographic lines, your cross-section lines. Um, if you want to put in lineations that uh, denote some boundary between something, um, Anything that's not a physical geologic feature that's a line would go into cartographic lines. So lineation is actually a bad example of that because that would actually go in geologic lines. Your folds tend to go in geologic lines. Um, if you want to uh, mark physiographic provinces or something like that, that would be in geologic line. Uh, 
but cartographic lines is basically the generic is um, cross-section lines and then any leaders. And don't worry about the leaders. We'll do those. Uh, but feel free to put your cross-section lines in here. Contacts and faults is anything that breaks or causes lithology to vary on the map. So this would be your... Uh, contacts and faults, uh, dikes if they split, um, units. Um, I've had a couple occasions where people used uh, fold contacts, and I, I struggle with this being an actual physical contact. I could see where maybe if you had a monocline, uh, on one side of that monocline you could have one thing exposed, and on the other side of that monocline you could probably have another thing exposed, due to erosional features and things like that, if it was a sharp enough monocline and it was um, small enough in scale that you couldn't show the contact actually occurring east or west of that monocline line. Uh, I could see where that could be the case, but for the most part, I think that the fold contacts are not the appropriate way to symbolize things. Um, but if it does happen, contacts, faults, anything that breaks lithology, anything that causes your lithology on the map to deviate goes in there. Uh, data source poly, don't worry about that. If you really want to mark where you map where versus where Mike maps, we can talk about that and we can draw those polygons. You can give me a hand drawn and I'll get that knocked out um, myself. Generic points is any generic points, and I know that's like the most vague thing in the world, but this would be things like volcanic vents or uh, springs isn't a good example because springs actually have an orientation. But any symbols that don't really have a strike dip component to them or a dip dip direction component to them, um, control points, survey stations, uh, things like that that don't really rotate based off of an orientation would go in there. These are mostly cartographic things uh, and um, more uh, points that are just a location more than geologic or scientific information. Um, generic samples are the locations where you take rock samples and in those you can go ahead and grab the uh, you know, put the sample ID number in your data table and things like that. Uh, it's just for basically sample points, where you collect a rock, where you write down the sample number on that rock, and then record it in the geo database. Geochron points. This is exactly like it sounds. It's your radiometric argon, argon, whatever, carbon dating date. Um, that's what that is. That is for age-related points. So where you took your sample and where your geochron point is can technically overlap because you can take a sample and then decide to date that sample. Those are the types of things that go in geochron points. Geologic lines, uh, I think... Um, I might need to go back and forth a little bit here. But with geologic lines, those are going to be things like your... Anticlines, synclines, monoclines, uh, anything that is a geologic line that isn't a lithologic representation, lithologic breaker, uh, a representation of a lithologic break in the map, it would go in geologic lines. Uh, an example of this where I say we're going to go back and forth is dikes. Dike can, a dike can be a contact. A dike can also happen in a fault zone. And a dike can also be a geologic line if it doesn't affect lithology. If it's ripping through the middle of a unit, that would be a geologic line. Um, you could even put um, internal contacts in contacts and faults, but you could technically also put internal contacts inside geologic lines. Uh, that internal contact shouldn't break lithology. It should be a inter-unit thing so the lithology doesn't change on either side of that side of that line so technically it's a geologic line but it can go in contacts and faults as well uh, that um, internal contact could be the margin of a um, volcanic crater or uh, the the marker of where that n n area is for the volcanic neck or something like that. That can be an internal contact because the neck itself is the same unit 
probably as the lava outflow. Um, multiple lobes of a lava outflow could go in internal contacts. And I know this doesn't apply to your area specifically, but just trying to give you the background of things. But those could also go in geologic lines. Uh, ash beds could go in geologic lines. Uh, technically, that ash bed should be... Um, inside or be thin enough that you can't mark it uh, as an area feature, but it could be the point between a separation of lithologic features, and in that case, then it should be a um, key bed or a marker bed or something like that that then splits lithology and go in contacts and faults. So I hope I actually didn't confuse you with that, but contacts and faults break lithology, geologic lines are things that lie within the geology that you can't denote by a polygon area feature as being a different feature left or right of that line. Isovalue lines, that's your isopack maps, anything you do with groundwater level or uh, depth to groundwater, anything like that. Um, map extent poly, you can ignore. Map unit points. Um, these are these things right here, the map unit points. Just go ahead and say, you know, on this side of the line is KCDC, on this side of this line is um, quaternary alluvium. Um, that's what map unit points is. Map unit polys will be the polygons we make from our contacts and faults using our map unit points, and we'll do that process if you want. And then there's orientation points, which are these, your strike and dips. Currently, these are symbolized weird and I'm sorry I can't actually get them to symbolize using the strike dip symbol and then have that strike dip symbol also rotate based on that parameter. Uh, we'll go into that in further detail and as a byproduct of how we record our strike dip this is in scientific notation because we denoted it as a floating point instead of a short integer. Uh, from now on, uh, after seeing this, I'm going to go ahead and record those as short integers from now on. So that instead of 8 times 10 to the 0, meaning it's dipping 8 degrees, uh, this will say 8. <laughs> uh, so you'll have to watch because that notation, the uh, magnitude actually changes. Um, the exponent changes. So there's some that are uh, 8 times 10 to the 1st would be... 80, or 3.2 times 10 to the first would be dipping 32 degrees. So be a little careful with that. And again, I'm sorry about that. There, it's a byproduct of how our database was originally created, and it has made me understand that in the future uh, it, that that will no longer be a floating point um, value. It'll just be a straight integer, so that it says eight. Um, other polys, we can put in other information in here, uh, like if you have a geomorphic surface or something like that. We could put that in other polys. Stations are stations if you wanted to record, if you were camping out here, you could put in this is where your camp was. And a lot of these things are probably um, a little absurd or ridiculous to record um, for sharing to the general public. But if you wanted that information, you could go ahead and put that in there, and then we'll just uh, hide that from when we serve this map out. Tick points are the tick points, and image legend is the image legend. Uh, we don't need to worry about the image legend too much. It's RGB. Um, but that is the overview of how this, your overlay control center, works. And uh, a lot of the times that is comes in turned off, to turn on your overlay control center is that button right there, and it pulls up that dialog box. This allows you to look at the layers, the f uh, shape files or rasters that are loaded into the map. And currently you can see that I have the DEM loaded in, and I've also got an image loaded in. And this image is huge. I'm going to go ahead and make a reduced size image, a reduced uh, area size and also resolution size image um, so that it's faster to load because you can see this is going to take quite a bit of time to load and then the other factor is when you zoom in and zoom out it has to reload the image uh, currently this is calling to a uh, WMS uh, web mapping service so it's calling to someone else's database and if you've got slow internet this is actually going to take longer because it's got a call to their web mapping service 
kick that information back to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make an image of this for you that's going to be reduced size, reduced area, and it'll just be permanent in this and it'll be much faster than what this is. As you can see, this is a little ridiculous. Um, but it'll allow you to then map directly on the um, orthophoto, much like you were in photogrammetry. The downfall is it's not 3D enabled, so there is no photogrammetric way to uh, view this information. But nonetheless, it'll at least assist you with location and also um, identifying features as well. And unfortunately, there's not a way to pause this recording while that loads up. I would pause it so that then I could continue so that you didn't have to sit here and watch this. Um, but I would, do, I would like the image to load up so that I can show you the drawing of some features and stuff like that. Because uh, it's easier to draw on the orthophoto, as you know. Our internet must be really slow today because this is taking an extraordinarily long time. But again, I'll get this corrected for you. And, and there's probably a couple of things. Uh, I'll just go ahead and say that right now. There's probably a couple of things that I will probably have to correct. Um, as I'm working on this video, I will probably see things that, oh shoot, I didn't do this or I'll need to correct this. So, um, I'm going to make a disclaimer right up front that if I do say those things, I have a notepad in front of me. I'm going to go ahead and denote those, uh, changes that I need to make to your data, uh, before I ship it off to you. And the first one is an image. And unfortunately, there is nothing I can do while that is loading up. One of the other things, yeah, see, I can't do anything. I'll wait. Again, I wish I had a pause recording button. Sorry about this. Okay, so I'm not sure why that image isn't showing up, but okay. Um, sure would be nice if it would. Um, one of the other dialog boxes that is convenient to have, I'll go over a little later, and it's this one right here, which is the settings box. I forget exactly what it's called, but it has a bunch of different variables that we can edit and alter in here. Um, but I, I, I kind of want to get go through the process of um, creating features. And again, I'm sorry for this delay. Um, in the future, I'll end up cutting a video together piece by piece. I'm doing this just as a live recording. Um, I don't have editing software on this computer or anything like that, so I have to do it this way. Uh, but in the future, when I create that generic video, it'll be less of this going on. Because I will be able to cut these parts out. Okay, we're going to have to ignore the image for the time being, and I'm sorry for that because uh, I really wanted to show it with that on there. Um, but here is the configuration, that's what it's called, tab. And there's a lot of abilities and things in here that we can adjust. Like currently, um, this is 0602. This is a um, your strike dip. This is your uh, inclined bedding. Um, we can adjust line styles in here. So I currently have a set of contacts and faults and a set of anticlines and synclines. Oh, only one syncline? Only one syncline in here. And then I've got the cross-section line predefined, and there's a whole bunch of these other things that we really don't need to be 
concerned with, but I also can't get rid of. Um, so uh, here's where I predefine those new types, and I'll go over that in a little bit. Um, and again, I'm not an expert at this, so please forgive me while I'm doing some of these things because I don't have this process completely nailed down perfectly. Um, but we'll go ahead and go through it. But this configuration tab um, is kind of a neat thing. It allows you to adjust things. Okay, so in order to create a feature, we'll want to use the digitizer tool, which is this right here. And it pulls up a panel of information that we can then go ahead, a panel of tools that we can then go ahead and use to create lines, create points, and create our strike dip points. The other thing that's weird about this is it doesn't specify in the beginning where we're putting these lines and points to. So um, let's go through the process of creating a line so you can see what I'm talking about. If I go ahead and click the create line feature, I can then go ahead and click my vertices to then start drawing a line. And naturally you would be doing something more like this to where you're actually following the contours of the image. And unfortunately I don't have one, but there we go. So I've now drawn my line. Now, let's say my last line, I want to snap to this line right here. As we get close enough, snapping is automatically turned on. And once I get close enough, it'll actually go ahead and snap to that line like it did right there. Now, I haven't created a vertice there. So if I want to close this line, let it snap, click your last control point, then right click to finish that line. And then what pulls up is this modify feature info dialog box. And from here, we can specify the feature type, what type of line we're drawing from this drop-down box. So I'm going to go ahead and say this is a 01.01.01, .01 a contact whose identity and existence is certain and its location is accurate. And once I click on this, we can see that the attributes down here have changed based on the template that I created. Um, but let's work top down. So the feature layer that I want this to create in is contacts and faults. So this is where you'll specify these lines go. So if I were to turn on geologic line, we could put this into the geologic line shape file. Currently we're working on contacts and faults. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in contacts and faults. Custom description, we're going to leave that alone. We want to specify or use the default style for selected feature type. And currently that is a solid line. If I were to switch to a normal fault or a fault, we can see that this is a darker line. If I switch to some other, let's go to a fold. We can see that this is a red dashed line for the uh, approximately located fold. And this is an anticline, so my arrows would be pointing on either side of this line. Unfortunately, I am not quite savvy enough yet to make it draw those arrow symbols in Global Mapper. Uh, I know how to do it in Map or ArcMap, but I don't know how to do it in Global Mapper yet. Hopefully, we can get there. Um, but we can see that uh, line change based on the parameters that we have set for this template. Inside of the attributes now are the length of the line and the bearing of the line. So overall, you can see that starting point to end point bearing is 114. So from here to here, the bearing of that line is 114, 47, 2.6. Um, these don't have uh, contact fault and fault IDs yet. Don't worry about that. I'll deal with that. And this is where the type comes in. So this would be a contact. If we switch to a fold, this would be a fold. And I think it's anticline versus syncline in the type. Uh, under the faults, this would be unspecified for a undefined slip sense. Uh, for the normal faults, the type would be a normal fault. And then we have the concealed feature. Is concealed? Is, is it concealed or is it not? So this would be your um, 07s and 08s, the very end being 07 or 08. Those two are location concealed. So is concealed would be yes in those circumstances. For our 0101, it is not concealed. Existence confidence is stated right here, is certain for identity and existence. Existence and identity. The location confidence 
meters is your confidence with how well you were located while you were identifying that point or while you were drawing that point. And to edit that, we would go ahead and either double click on this or you can click highlight it and say edit. This pulls up that dialog box. Now for location confidence, we want to go ahead and say that the location confidence is, oh, I am certain to within a meter, half a meter, 10 meters, 300 meters, whatever the case may be. You are certain to within that parameter, plus or minus that parameter of how certain you are with the location. And when we have in there negative 9999, that means unspecified or unknown value or out of range. That's typically what that means. The negative 9999 means out of range. We leave that in there because we don't have a value for it unless you tell us what that value is. So location confidence, if you have one, go ahead and edit this. Make sure you go ahead and put in parameters here because it actually means something for people when they are uh, trying to find your contact. Uh, if it's plus or minus, you know, 100 meters, well, they could be wandering all over the place trying to find it. But if you mark it on your map and it's plus or minus one meter, Cool, they know that it's right along that line, plus or minus one meter. They should be able to find it within um, six feet of where you drew it. Um, then there's the symbol. These will be specific to the template type, you know, 0101 being that contact whose identity and existence is certain and its location is accurate. And let's say we were drawing um, a fault. Let's let's switch this now to a fault. Let's make it a normal fault whose identity and existence is certain, but its location is concealed. So our line now draws as a two pixel thick dotted line. And we notice that um, because it's now concealed, it's now showing as concealed, yes, instead of no. And our symbology changed. Oops, and I didn't edit the default parameter for location confidence. Um, but we can also apply a label to this. So we can call this fault something. This is the um, Heron Reservoir fault or whatever the case may be. Um, oops, there we go. Um, so, you know, you this is where you can apply a name to this fault, apply a name to this fold. Um, so feel free to use the label as the physical label, the physical name of the feature. And then there should be also a notes Field. Yeah, so type normal fault. There should also be a notes field. And in here, if you edit that, you can say this was drawn by Phil for whatever the case may be, whatever your note is. Um, I found this fault on the most absolute rainy, miserable day in the world, and I never want to go back there again. Whatever the case may be, this is your notes to you or... Um, Anything you want to denote about this, like um, this fault, uh, the, it, there was breccia on either side of it, or um, uh, hydrothermally um, precipitated barite was found in the fault. Whatever you want to denote about that, uh, you could put in notes, um, whether it be field notes or notes about the fault itself. And I'm going to skip altitude mode. I'll take care of that later on. But you just so you know, you can go ahead and say, you know, relative to ground. And it should be getting that ground uh, elevation from the DEM. Um, I need to play with this more. But, you know, don't worry about it too much. But note that we can start giving this that third dimension value as well. And again, that applies to the altitude mode. And then you can go ahead and say, okay, uh, probably... Uh, if you were specifying clamp to ground, you would check this. That means that all the features created from now on in this feature class of this type would pick up that clamp to ground value. 
I'm going to uncheck that because I am still working with that and unfamiliar with how it actually functions. So until I get a better grasp of that, I just want to leave that alone. Then once we click OK, it applies those parameters and draw the line as we specified. So I'm going to go ahead and draw another fault here. Click my last vertex, right click. I am going to give this an, um, let's do, and it should draw as a dotted line, but I noticed that my fault didn't, so I'm a little concerned with that. Our parameters change based on the fact that we're drawing contacts and faults. Make sure we're saving it in contacts and faults. Click OK, line. So this actually starts happening pretty quick. We draw our line, we say what line it is, where we're saving, and basically it should keep this one active while you're drawing lines. And you say OK, and we could just keep drawing lines, right click, OK. It's weird that you have to draw the line, right click to finish it, and then this dialog pops up every single time. But it is the way you can oops, specify what line type it is right off the bat. So I'm not sure why that's not drawing the color it's supposed to be. I may need to adjust that. So let me make a note of that really quick. If I don't get that fixed though, just know that at least at the very minimum, your contacts will draw as thin lines and your faults should draw as thick lines. I thought I made it to where the folds would draw as thick red lines, but maybe I didn't get that adjusted. So let me check symbology. Okay, so that is creating lines. Let's go over creating points. So let's say you were digitizing your uh, map unit points. We could go here, and like I said, actually before I do that, let me show you how to delete features. So currently we are drawing lines. I finished my line, I'm okay with it. Now I realize, oh, every single one of these lines is bad. We need to turn off our create lines feature. So just unclick that um, toolbar box in order to be able to see the edit cursor now versus the line cursor. So now I'm in edit mode. If this is turned on, we can also just come up here and click on the digitizer tool and it unchecks any of these that are turned on. So if I'm on points, if I'm on points and I want to switch to edit, I could just click that and I'm back into edit mode so where I can select my lines or points, whatever the case may be. Um, so I drew this line and I don't like it anymore. Oops, I don't want that one in there. Switch to my uh, edit tool. Then we can go ahead and select these and to multi-select we hit control and then click the second line we want to select. So we can go through and select all these lines. And let's say I wanted to delete them, then all I have to do is hit the delete button or right click and do clear current, uh, excuse me, delete selected features and those will be deleted then. Now, moving on to map unit points. Click our point tool, we come over here, it pulls this up, we can call this a, and I don't have this template set up so let me make a note of that map unit point template. Uh, we would pick the map unit point template that best defines that. Um, I'm just going to make this generic and you'll have to edit the property of map unit. Um, Yeah, so currently I'm just going to go ahead and say address label. There'll be a map unit point feature type set up for you. Um, we want to save this in map unit points. This will populate with all those attributes, like I said. Say OK, and there's my point. And then we can just do this over and over again for all the points that we need to create that represent our map unit points. Um, I'm going to set that up really quick. Uh, let me do strikes and dips and then I'll show you uh, creating templates. Uh, just in case you need to create a new template for yourself. So there's these three points. Again, those are bad. I click my digitizer tool so I uncheck my point. I can then select these features and delete them. 
And at some point, you may want to check that box that says, don't show me the dialog box that says, I, yes, I understand I'm deleting these. Um, I haven't done that yet just because I, I, I'm still learning this digitizing process here, and I want to make sure I'm doing things the right way before I just blast off and start checking checkboxes that warn me of things. So, to place another strike dip, now new strike dips won't draw like this one. But to place a new strike dip, we do the create strike and dip point tool. And it works very similar to the create points tool. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click my strike dip point tool. And currently we have this set up to dip azimuth. And then we can specify our dip direction based off of magnetic north, true north, however you want to set this. And here we enter our dip dip value. So let's call that 55. We want it to be a dip bedding small black symbol. It is strike dip. It is going into orientation points. And then we say OK. And currently that didn't draw with the orientation and I don't quite understand why it does this but this is how it works. So I want to select the feature. So I'm going to switch off my um, create strike dip tool. I select this again. I go ahead and specify the angle I want it to do, and then it starts rotating. I'm not quite sure why it does this, but then from now on, it seems like it works just fine. So if I click here, I want this to be 21. I'm going to make my dip 60. It's going into orientation point. I say OK. Then they seem to rotate. So I'm not entirely sure, but it seems like that first one doesn't want to rotate. And maybe it was just because I put it at 4, but when I was playing around this earlier, I put it at 70 and it stayed pointing at uh, north. So I'm not entirely sure why that was doing it, but maybe it's a fluke of me being special, but whatever. So now we can go ahead and we can see in the window how it's going to draw for us. So we can see that rotation increase as we pick our strike dip azimuth value. Enter in the dip, make sure it's saving an orientation point, click OK. Now we have our orientation points. The nice part about this is these actually show up the correct way versus these. But I can't get the pre-existing orientation points to show up like strike dip symbols. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong there. I'm going to play around with that and try and figure that out later on. Okay. So that is creating strike dips. Um, we went over lines, we went over points, we went over strike dip, and how to save the location of where these things are going. Uh, I want to talk about now, talk now about editing features and new templates. So we saw in my contacts and faults, let's go ahead and draw a fault in, ripping through here snapping to here, right click to finish the line. Let's make this a normal fault, whose identity and existence is certain. Now we can edit these attributes just like I had shown earlier, like my location confidence by double clicking or clicking the edit button. And we can go ahead and put in a value of our location confidence. 56 meters, we're satisfied that it's somewhere in here. And then we say, okay. So we can edit this later on. We can also edit the line when we realize, oh, no, 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 no. I need to give this the name because this is a continuation of some other fault. Select the feature, right click, edit line feature, and it pulls up that modify feature info dialog box again where we can go ahead and give it a label and say this is major fault, whatever the case may be. Edit our identity confidence, those types of things, or location confidence, those types of things. So we can come back to this dialog box after we have already saved a point as well. So don't think you're locked in. We can change the type of it, and these parameters will alter based on that template's predefined parameter. You will have to go back in and change your location confidence if you've already put one in, things like that. But it allows you to go back in and edit your attribute table. So I'm going to say cancel. I'm going to delete that. Yes. Okay. So now um, that's editing features. 
Let's go into our new templates. Talk, let's talk about making a new template. Let's say you needed a new line, point, or polygon type for your area. Let's do the map unit polys because that's one that I haven't set up yet. So I can actually do um, kill two birds with one stone here by creating that map units template and show you how to do that map unit template. Okay, so if I go ahead and I want to create a point, I create the point, and since I don't have a template for it, there's nothing popping up. I can go ahead and say create new type, and this will allow me to do it, but I want to do it another way. So this is a word of warning. I can come here, and I can set in some parameters for it, but it doesn't create a new template. So again, this is a word of warning. This is a one-off point type. You can add all the information in that you want, but it doesn't create the template quickly by default. So. What we want to do is actually come to our configuration panel like I discussed earlier, or I briefly talked, touched on earlier. If we come to point styles, line styles, or area styles, we can alter our predefined templates. So currently we want to edit the point styles. I want to make a new type. This type is going to be map unit point we're going to make this symbol a uh, dot there it is I'm going to make this a four point so that it's not intruding and say okay so there's our map unit point, and I'm probably going to call this something else so it shows up at the top of this list so it's easier to find. Now what we can do is define our attributes for it. So this allows us to set up that default attribute. So we want to say add attribute. We're going to go ahead and add in our data source ID, DSO2, um, so data source ID. Currently we have... DSO1 as me because I drew in some of these lines and some of these uh, strike dips. But since we have to give them a default parameter and the default template in ARC is that DSO1, I ended up with DSO1. At some point, we'll change all of that to where you, you know most of my influence on this map is either eradicated or whatever the case may need to be. But currently, um, go ahead and make you DSO2. And DSO2 stands for data source 02, which would be you. And that would make Mike DSO3. That allows us to be able to denote who did what on the map. Um, another thing, if we had another map that we were calling from when we were doing the strike dips, actually, that's what DSO1 will become is because we referred to some other map publication to get some of these strike dips in. Then we could just go ahead and cite DSO1 in the database in a data table as being Glen Gary, Glen Ross map 2013, whatever the case may be. Um, so this is another way that you can also uh, reference other maps that you used in that uh, you're, you're in the mapping process. So we can denote, um, you know, let's call it 55 is the Glengarry Glen Ross map of 2013. And 56 is the Glengarry Glen Ross map of 1978. So we can add a whole bunch of data sources to be able to denote who did what or where we got our information from. It's a great way to do a reference list and things like that. So you are currently going to be DSO2. We're going to say, okay. Um, so we can add in our attributes here, like one of the ones that we need to want add in is map unit. We're going to leave that one blank because that is the difference between that KDC and our QAL over here. So we'll leave that blank. That one you will have to edit every time you add a map unit, similar to doing the templates in ArcGIS. So map unit. We need a label and we need a symbol and we need a map unit 
point ID. And that'll be M-U-P-T-01. You don't have to worry about this. This is mostly for us. Um, actually, I'm not even going to put that in, in there. I can get it in later on. But this is where we can edit our attributes associated with that. So we'll also want notes. And uh, those are the main parameters that I think you need for digitizing map unit points. I can't think of anything else that you would need in map unit points. The one that we really need you to edit is that map unit. Okay, so now we have specified our map unit point with some default attributes. We can adjust the way the symbol is drawing, all sorts of information like that. We can apply custom symbols and things like that. This is where I think I need to get that strike dip in there for our 0601 point and get that parameter adjusted and then also I need to find the way to tell it to rotate off of this. I found this but this isn't exactly how it should be but anyway. Um, so now we've defined our map unit point we can say OK and now when we create a point we can call it a and this is why I want to make it some thing up here so that we don't have to come down here and find map unit point. We'll save this in map unit points and then we'll call this map unit. Now because this is QAL, we'll call it QAL. I don't know what that unit is, but for all intents and purposes, there it is. That's actually where the lake is, I think. Um, so we say, okay, you can ignore label for the time being. I will get that information from QAL same with symbol. Here is just where you would want to edit your notes for it. Um, quick, uh, maybe this is a redundant statement. I think you and I have talked about this before, um, but let's go ahead and talk about it again. Just I'll try and be really quickly. The map unit is the map unit no matter what. It's also the um, ASCII character, the keyboard specific character of the unit. For example, if we were doing a Pennsylvania unit, you would type capital I, capital P, and then whatever that unit is. This lets me know that that is the Pennsylvania, and when I put this into label, the character that I want to draw from the FGDC codebook is actually star S. This will draw that symbol for the IP, the Pennsylvania S unit. So that is what that would look like. And it's sort of the same process as well if we have a questionable identity for this unit as well. So let's say the map unit is IPS, but I am uncertain as to whether I identified that block correctly. I can come in and it's still splat S, but we want to label it as a splat S star S question mark denoting that the map unit we want it to draw as is IPS, but we want to label that specific unit as questionable as to whether it's identified correctly. So that would be the same for something like capital T, capital R, C. There's our Chin Li. We say, okay, in label, it's caret C. That would then draw as that TR symbol C. And again, if we're uncertain as to whether or not we've identified that correctly, we just throw a question mark at the end of the label. So the unit will always be whatever we think it is, no matter how confident we are, will be the map unit. But we can then specify more precisely how confident we are with the label. I hope this is uh, makes sense. I think I've talked about this before. If not, and you don't quite follow, let me know. I can go over this again. But for this one, let's go ahead and say we're confident with its identity. It's TRC. Symbol we can ignore for the time being. And notes, this is where you would add in specific notes. Uh, undifferentiated, Chin Li, we didn't specify lower, middle, upper. We just called, we grouped it as undivided. So it's the full Chin Li package. Okay, now we can see that it's labeling with our caret C, just like this is labeling with 
FGDC. Now, I don't have the FGDC code specified in here for that label, or FGDC font. And I don't think I can actually specify my font anywhere in here. Yeah, sure enough. So this is the exact reason why we use the IP or the uh, TR in text because if you don't know that caret is TR or you don't know splat is IP or you don't know underscore is that Cambrian symbol and equals is the pre-Cambrian symbol, uh, people won't know what this is supposed to symbolize without that specific font. So that's why it's nice to use map unit, and then we can see that that's TRC. But eventually, when we go into cartography, we end up using the label so that we can actually get it to draw that correct character symbol. So again, I'm sorry I went into so much detail about that. I hope that's actually helpful and not at all a hindrance or confusing in any way. I'm going to switch this back to map unit so that we can see this symbolize as we think we should. Uh, so it's So we can communicate to uh, people without the font, what unit that is. And that's really what that means. Okay, so that's adding in a template. And it's the same thing for adding in a line template as well. So we can come to our configuration. We can add in a new line style. We'll put in a new type. We'll specify that this is... Uh, let's put in 01.0... Oh, sorry, 01.01.02. This is a contact. It's uh, sorry, identity. Identity and existence are questionable. Location Location is accurate. Well, we want to denote that with a solid line, one pixel, black, no background line. It'll draw like this. We say OK. Now with our 010102, we can edit our attributes and add attributes in, same as we were doing with that point. So we want data source ID, predefine the template to populate with your number, edit the attribute with that. We want existence confidence. Now the existence confidence this, for this one can be questionable. The identity confidence is questionable. With regard to that though, you can specify which is questionable. So we just said identity and confidence are questionable. Which one? We can say that, oh, the identity is certain. There's, you know, it's a contact. There's no doubt about it. Um, but the certainty with what each of those represents, we can alter. So maybe it's the existence. We see something on the ground, and this would probably be more uh, pertinent to fault. So let's use it as a fault as the example for the difference between identity confidence and existence confidence. There's something here. I can't identify it as a fault or not. So the identity is questioned, but something exists here. We can go ahead and ed edit this to be certain. So you can have these be different, but this will pre-populate this template with these default values. And that's kind of what I'm trying to get at is this default type attribute setup. This will be the parameters that come in by default, no matter what, which is the reason why we're leaving notes blank. It's the reason why we're leaving a label blank. For this one, let's go ahead and denote it like it should be, questionable, questionable, because that's kind of what this says, but if you know more specifically or you want to express more explicitly uh, which is questionable, you can do so. We then also want to add in, is it concealed or not? This one is not concealed. A label, that's blank, so you can add it in later. 
Location confidence, by default, we're going to put in 99999. Symbol is 01.01.02. .01 .01 and our type is a contact. So because all of these are predefined in my template, a lot of these come up automatically. So that's one of the other nice things. As you edit these, these values um, are available to you in drop downs. That's the reason why I can keep pulling these things up fairly quickly. Um, so it, it is pretty nice default setup for you. It should allow you to do everything you need. Oops, right. Notes. So then we get everything in that we need to uh, in the attribute table. And in, by default, these are the parameters that'll come in. And this also the way Global Mapper handles this is pretty nice too, because you can pull in these parameters very quickly. And voila, now we have our template for 01.01.02. And we can go ahead and draw that line in now. So we can click our two control points, right click, and we want 010102. Our parameters come in, we say okay, and it draws like it specifies. Um, I think that covers the majority of what uh, potentially could be a pitfall um, or how to digitize, let's put it that way, in Global Mapper. Uh, one of the things that we'll need to talk about later in the future is how to get these things back to me. And it'll probably just be a quick discussion. Um, probably won't be too much detail needed with it. Uh, but you can see that we have features that have been added and deleted and some of these parameters come through and I need to make sure that I can get things back out again. That's probably for a later video. Um, but I think how to digitize has actually been made clear. Uh, if not, please ask questions. Please let me know what I can do to clear things up. Um, I showed you how to add new templates so that hopefully if you need a specific line type, you can get that in. And we also talked about where features go um, in each of these shape files. And again, at any time, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. But that should be the basics of what we need to cover and what we need to go over uh, to get you at least started. And again, I am so sorry for the delay in this. It's, it's, I, I really apologize for it. Um, but I will get this map bundled up, packaged up, and sent to you here in the next couple days. I will probably also include either a link to this video, and I dread the thought of putting this on YouTube, but no one watches my videos anyway, so I don't think it really matters. Um, but I'll find a way to get this video to you, and I'll share a link with you. And... That should be about it. And again, if you have questions on this, feel free to contact me. I will get this all bundled up and packaged up probably by the end of the day and then send you a link. I know you're watching this video going, why are you telling me this? Um, I, I apologize. This is my first video, and this is the reason why I wish I had pause, edit, clip, and a video editing software so I could cut this chunk out. Anyway, thanks, Scott. Sorry for all the yammering on, um, but I hope this actually helps. Um, I guess that's all I have. Thanks.